as we move along, but I also want to comment that all of the information that has been provided will be shown up on the screen in entirety, so those, there's nothing you'll miss by simply following along on the screen, but those PowerPoints are available to you now and going forward as well. Now at this point, I would like to recommend that you close down any applications that you won't need for the next hour and a half so that you can provide your undivided attention to our presenters. And then finally, I just want to comment that with so many people on the call and and uh, it's such a, a dynamic topic that uh, we do encourage question and answers throughout the presentation and uh, our presenters certainly are happy to answer the questions uh, as we move along and uh, as well as at the end of the presentation but when you do submit your questions please make them as clear as possible and keep in mind that um, if you have a question uh, that relates to a certain slide you should uh, please let us know what slide you're referring to and what content as uh, maybe a few minutes uh, at least before the question is responded to. So uh, we, uh, with, this, with that said, I'd now like to turn the presentation over to Chris and Damien. Scott, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody. Chris Fredrickson, uh, you get pretty excited about tax season, don't you? I do and uh, particularly this week we've been getting out all of our uh, year-end letters to our clients uh, talking about the fiscal cliff talking about how important it is that if they're going to buy fixed assets, they do it uh, within the next couple of weeks, and also helping clients making some big gifts, and we're talking about big, uh, because of the uh, estate tax exemption, which is going to change dramatically on Jan 1. So, yeah, it's an exciting time. Uh, I look at tax season like a trip to Vegas. You just go in there and pull the handle, and man, it's ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. That money just pours out. So, yeah, I get excited about tax season. And tax season is the best marketing opportunity for any accounting firm. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of accounting firms don't take advantage of it. So, over the next 90 minutes, we want to give you ideas that we've seen be successful in our own firm and in firms around the country. We work with hundreds of firms at the 2020 Group, so these really are the best of the best ideas. So with that in mind, any questions, please plug those into the question section and we'll do our best to answer them, or we might uh, circle back with you following the webinar and get those answers to you as well. But uh, please participate as much as you can. Damien, we're going to be showing uh, a lot of documents, a lot of samples. Uh, how do people get that if they want it? We'll talk about that. That's what we call our, our marketing, uh, our tax season marketing bundle, and we'll refer to that throughout the, uh, the presentation. But that's basically available via our website, and it includes everything that we're talking about. It also includes some complimentary consulting so that you can spend half an hour to get your marketing plan uh, really revved up because we've got a fairly narrow window. But let's go straight into that, today's agenda, and let's talk about our growth goals. What are your growth goals? Uh, how much do you want to grow this year? How much can, do you have capacity to grow? What's your budget? These are all really important questions that we need to be asking before we launch into this marketing effort because one of the biggest uh, challenges that we see in marketing is a lot of folks go down the path of marketing but don't really have any clear objective. Don't really say, I want to bring in 50 new individual clients at an average transaction value of $750. Or this tax season, I want to grow 7% uh, revenue. Let's take some time after this webinar to think about what the growth goals are, and, and then we can start building the plan. Because if somebody says, I have a, a growth goal of $100,000 and their budget is maybe $5,000, there's a mismatch there, there's a disconnect there. So we've got to think strategically. What do we want to bring in in terms of new clients? What do we want to bring in terms of, and, and what's the breakdown between individuals and business clients because there's a different approach to both? What about cross-selling to our current clients? Are there opportunities there, some low-hanging fruit? And we'll, we'll show you uh, our letter that we, we sent out for tax planning. That's a great opportunity to cross-sell more services to your current clients. So what we're going to do is we're going to launch the first poll, actually, just to make sure everyone's paying attention and ask the question, what are your growth goals this coming tax season? So this is the first poll, and uh, we'll leave that open for uh, uh, 90 seconds or so. But Chris, what sort of growth should firms be aiming for, or what have you seen out there in the marketplace? Well, of course, after the uh, Great Recession uh, in 2009, 2010, we saw relatively low growth rates across the industry. Yes, in the low single digits. For 2012, we've seen it pick up quite a bit, uh, certainly among 
our member firms. Um, and I'll just, uh, as an aside, say that 2020 Group is now the world's largest membership organization for small and medium-sized firms. We have about 5,000 member firms um, around the world. And we poll constantly with those firms. This, in 2012, um, our members are telling us that they're getting in the 10 to 12 percent range and are looking for about the same uh, in 2013. I'd like to focus on the next question, with, which is, what is your budget? What we found is that if you want to be successful with marketing in your CPA firm, it is really, really important to have somebody whose job it is to do the marketing. And our, our um, observation is that the, the, you cannot have someone who's got another job in the firm to, to be a part-time marketer. So if someone's in charge of receivables or collections or the receptionist, making that person part-time marketer does not work. What we have found work extremely well in the last year is smaller firms uh, going out and getting uh, an intern from a local university or college and uh, bringing that person in for uh, let's say two or three afternoons a week and doing the marketing. So as we go through the marketing uh, discussion and as we talk about all of the different initiatives, think about bringing someone in, either as we said an intern possibly a brand new graduate, and God knows there are enough uh, people who just graduated college who would love the opportunity um, to, to get some experience in a CPA firm. So Chris, from the poll we see that uh, uh, about a fifth of the audience are looking for 16% or more, uh, about 15% looking somewhere between 11 and 15%, the vast majority in that 6 to 10% range, which I think is definitely achievable. 20% uh, have, have come in at one, 1 to 5, and 8% have been status quo. So maybe some of their clients have gone away, uh, and they're looking to replace those. And Heather comments, my growth goal is to double my income in 2013. We're new and we're growing, and that's fantastic. So hopefully, Heather, there'll be some ideas that you can implement here uh, to, to help that growth. But uh, definitely factor that into your budget. Let's get straight into it. Um, on the subject of the budget, people always ask, what should we be budgeting? Uh, the answer is uh, the best firms we're seeing budget around about anywhere from 3 to 5% of annual revenue should be going towards marketing. About half of that goes to pay the marketing person, and about half of that is used for uh, the costs of doing the marketing. So the first area we'll go into uh, is direct mail. And it doesn't matter who you're going after, whether we're using uh, individual clients as the example here, it still is a plan, it's a process and it's a, a, a disciplined series of activities that we have to do. Direct mail has a very strong return on investment. I do a lot of coaching with firms and I always ask each month, what did we get the most appointments by? What did we get the most new uh, clients from? And time and time again, uh, direct mail always comes out. But for it to be successful, it has to be consistent. We want to drip on a number of, we want to drip on our target audience more than once a year. We want to drip on them five times a year, six times a year, and we've got to stick to the plan. Um, it's very difficult to say what is the return on investment from direct mail because we've got to think about marketing as using as many platforms as possible to drip on people, to get our name out in front of people. And in many respects, for example, signage on the side of the road is one way in which we drip on people passing our offices. So we've got to be thinking, we can't think negatively or we can't think um, isolated uh, our direct mail campaigns because it really is a combination of a number of activities that cause people to pick up the phone, that cause them to recognize it. So while one letter goes out, if, we don't, if the phone doesn't start immediately ringing, we've still got to stick to the plan. So that's what I would definitely recommend is stick to the plan, and if we stick to the plan, it will pay off. Uh, so individual clients. We love individual clients, don't we, new individuals? Well, I like good individual clients. Uh, I don't want to ever take on a client that isn't profitable. So. Uh, we have minimums, uh, as most of you do, uh, but we like quality 1040s. Not only 
uh, because of the fee we get for preparing tax returns, but we are also one of those firms that also does wealth management. So when we take on a client, we tell them it's all or nothing. If you're going to come to us, we're going to prepare your tax return, but we also need to help you uh, with your wealth management because to do just one without the other um, is inappropriate. And one of the best campaigns we've had for individual clients is our new homeowners campaign. So we go to homeown.org and we say we want uh, all new homeowners within a 15-mile radius of our office with a house value of $700,000 or more. And that's really important to specify the house value because more often than not, that takes out maybe the first-time home buyers that probably are not going to be repeat clients that, that won't have the wealth management, that won't be a profitable tax re return. So this is really important. And we're in Marin County, so $700,000 uh, is obviously high. But think about your area. What is a good quality client look like in terms of a house value? So we go to homeown.org, and I think they came back with 500 names this year of people that have moved into our county within 10 to 15 miles of our office. And uh, this is the campaign that we send to them. Now, it's a little bit too late for the, the welcome letter. So uh, if you were doing this a little bit earlier, we would normally start our welcome letter in around October if not uh, on the quarter that they've actually moved in. But let's launch straight into letter number two, which needs to go out this week or next to talk about tax planning. Because as it says right there, now is the time uh, for year-end tax planning, and the first half hour is free. And we get a lot of take-up of this, don't we, Chris? We do, and a lot of people are getting mail, for example, this time of the year from accountants. Uh, and we find that they open mail that comes from accountants because they don't really know what the content likely to be. And as you can see, the letter is uh, friendly and upbeat, and we get a lot of good, good feedback. And I had a look at the AICPA letters, and they get very technical very quickly, and all of a sudden they're three and four pages long. And I, I think that puts people... Um, into this unease section and, and not really willing to call, whereas this is very lighthearted. Uh, we know that buying or selling a home, changing jobs or starting a business will usually impact your tax status substantially. Why not uh, come in for 30 minutes of free tax planning? Give us a call to arrange complimentary year-end tax planning. Now, often folks will call in and they will actually, we'll be able to answer a lot of those questions over the phone and that's probably the folks that we really can't see a long-term relationship with. So if there's an opportunity to get in front of them beforehand and identify whether or not they're a good fit, let's answer those questions and then move on to the next folks. I would also, in sending this letter number two out, I'd probably add a paragraph which you can write yourself about the fiscal cliff uh, because that raises people's anxiety, um, which causes them to be more likely to pick up the phone. So now once we send out uh, letter number two, which as we said goes out right now, the, the next one is the most important of all the letters. And the first line is enclosed is your free tax organizer. It's not uh, go to our website to download a free tax organizer. It's not call us for your free tax organizer. Uh, and here is our uh, a sample of our four-page tax organizer, which is in the marketing bundle, but it's a very simplified four-page document, so a bifold document that looks at collecting information, but more importantly, it will help you organize your tax information and make sure you don't miss any important deductions. So before we've even gotten into an engagement with the clients, we're demonstrating some value. We're giving something away for free or complimentary, which I think is incredibly useful and incredibly valuable. And we found that this should go out at the end of January. We used to send them out the middle of January, but we found that the people that that picked up were folks maybe with a simpler return, just a couple of W-2s and a couple of other things. But when it went out at the end of January, we picked up some more complex returns, just as the K-1s or the first versions of the K-1s were coming in, the 1099s were coming in. So that was something that we learned and uh, incredibly useful. So on the four-page tax organizer there, uh what you will do is is go in and obviously take our name out and put yours in and you'll be able to change the text any way that you want. But we find that the new clients that come to us uh, during tax season, 
the vast majority of them actually go in and, and fill in the tax organizer. So it helps to get those clients integrated into the, into the practice quickly. What we also want you to do is not only send this organizer out to new homeowners, we want you to send it out to all of your existing clients. So when you send out you know, the big organizer, whether you're on LACERT or UltraTax or whatever, uh, s send out a couple of extras um, with a little sticky note on that says, uh, if you're, or if you know of anyone that might need help with their taxes, please pass this along. And most importantly, the uh, the intern, the marketing intern, is writing those now uh, on the post-it notes. That's really important. So what we want to make sure that we're doing is we're getting those post-it notes on there and just saying, if you know of anyone that needs tax help, uh, please pass on this organizer. That's really important to get out to our current clients, to get out to our referral sources, uh, and anyone that uh, that is willing to take that. So um, this tax organizer is part of the tax season marketing bundle, which we'll show you a little bit later on. So that's a really important one. Then new homeowner number four goes out March 1st, and not a lot of accountants are marketing uh, around March 1. This can either be a letter or a, uh, a postcard, but it says time is running out, but there's still time. We recently sent you the tax organizer. Let's get it. Let's get everything organized and get in now and, and get that return filed before April 15. And uh, we'll gladly quote you over a fee over the phone. And if you'd like to schedule an appointment, uh, call and we'll arrange one immediately. What's really important there, and it's also similar in our final postcard, is that uh, call us today for an over the phone quote. That's really important. Everybody in our office is uh, empowered to quote a fee over the phone. So we have a matrix and uh, the, an associated script that people can run through asking particular questions that once they go through the questions, whoever picks up that phone is able to say, uh, based on what you've told me, it looks like the, the fee will likely be $650. Now, if, uh, if we don't hear them uh, a sharp intake of breath or we don't hear them fall off the chair, the next line in that script is, would it be worthwhile scheduling an appointment with one of the partners to confirm all the details? And that confirm all the details is really important because if the client comes in and their paperwork is a mess and they've got a ton more information than they indicated over the phone, that's where the partner can now say, oh, hang on, based on the conversation, this is what we knew, but now this is a much more complex engagement, so this is what the fee will be. We agree all of our individual return fees up front, and that's incredibly important. But call us today for an over-the-phone quote. That differentiates us markedly, Chris, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think what also differentiates, differentiates us markedly is the fact that we're marketing on the 1st of April. Uh, most most firms are not looking for new clients on the 1st of April. But if you think about, if you suddenly took, took off your accountant hat and put on your marketing hat and said to yourself, what are the best two weeks in the entire year to be getting new clients? I'd have to contend it's the first two weeks of April. So we get really good response uh, to this final postcard. And it it's just, it, it works great. And interesting on, on the back side of that is uh, see what others are saying about us on Yelp. So we'll talk about that sh uh, shortly. Albert makes a really good comment that uh, uh, just find the neighborhood that you like working in and really target, target, target. And we're going to talk about networking. We're going to talk about Chamber of Commerce. We're going to talk about ways in which people can drive, uh, drive them to you. And we're doing that ourselves this year of actually narrowing the, the neighborhoods that we're going after, going after a smaller neighborhood, but making sure that we do a consistent job of making sure we get all of these mail pieces out. That's, that's exactly right. The keys to success for direct mail, we've got to stick to the plan. And if we've got budget constraints, we want to narrow the focus, not the number of pieces we're using. So maybe we might bring that down to um, instead of a thousand people, it might bring it down to 500. But let's follow the plan and get targeted with our uh, our direct mail. Um, with the final postcard, do you promise the return to be completed by April 15, Chris? No. What if you if you read it, what it what it says is that um, there's still time, 
but what inevitably happens, of course, those people uh, will go on extension, and that has never been an issue. That's never they because there's almost always missing information. Yeah, so don't be worried about where on the website to find. We'll show you where to find the uh, the resources and the tax season marketing bundle on on our website. So don't be worried about that now. How do you set the rates to get a good client, Chris? What do you think is the best strategy there in setting the rates? Well, have a look at the uh, our pricing matrix, uh, the form that we use, which we use to train uh, all the people in our office to be able to uh, to quote fees. Um, we happen to, to want a minimum fee of around 750. In many of the places across the country, your minimum is going to be 350. Uh, you just decide where you want to position yourself. And I just want to make sure that I make money off of every return. So let's have another poll question and ask, do you have a written marketing plan? And one of the things we're going to talk about while people are having uh, uh, answering that poll, we'll keep it open for about 90 seconds just so everybody can get to that poll. I know it's important for CPE this time of year. One of the things that our intern is currently doing is they're writing thank you cards. Uh, this is a huge um, success for us. Five days after our return is delivered to our clients, they receive a thank you note from the firm uh, just to say thank you for giving Fredrickson and Company the opportunity to do your tax returns. We really appreciate your patronage. If you know of anyone else who needs help with their taxes, please ask them to call us. And for each tax client we refer you, we'll treat you to a dinner for two at Avenue Grill. So just as we've delivered uh, the engagement to our client, five days later a thank you card goes out to our clients and that has been very successful in encouraging referrals and we get a lot of referrals off that thank you card. So get somebody writing those thank you cards now. And uh, Damien, I just got to add that when you do the thank you card, one of the most important things you have to do is to put two business cards in with any promotional piece you send out. Because what the client is likely to do is to read the letter or read the card and say, that was very nice. But they typically will keep the business card. They don't throw your business card away because there's a psychological issue about disrespecting people by if you throw away their business card. So we have a lot of um, good referrals off of this. And of course, often, if we buy dinner for two, uh, it'll often involve the client then taking out the person they referred. So it, 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 it feeds on itself and it works well. Mark says he sends out a Christmas card to all clients with a letter reminding them about tax season coming up and call with questions. Uh, interesting point, Mark, but already we're getting a lot of Christmas cards. So sometimes it's really difficult for your card and your letter to stand out when in the mail there's a lot of a thank you card, uh, Merry, uh, happy holiday cards, and then also a lot of that Christmas marketing that's going on. So it'll be interesting to see one of the things we do send out after Christmas is a Happy New Year card. So we do send out a lot of different things, but we try and move it around the typical um, those typical holiday dates because they're already getting a lot of information and we want our card to stick out. So normally, uh, they've finally gotten through their Christmas mail around December 28, 29, then they get a uh, Happy New Year card from us. So that's just another idea. And you let's just have a look at the poll, Chris. We've got 85% saying there's no written marketing plan. And I think all we need to do is sit down and have a couple of ideas, put a couple of initiatives in place and voila, we have a written marketing plan, assign responsibility to someone and away we go. Michelle says, uh, no, but we rely on social media referrals and blogs. It sounds like you've got a bit of a marketing plan going on there, Michelle. Probably not formalized, but uh, you'll see if hopefully we'll give you some ideas from the social media uh, and referrals and blogs. Bruce, are they uh, reprinted or handwritten? They're all handwritten and they're all handwritten by our interns. So I think that makes a huge difference uh, from the sincerity level rather than just a printed card. And, and then, we also just pass the card around the office and get a couple of other people to sign it so it's not just the partner's responsibility. So the, the handwriting doesn't have to be the partner's handwriting. The handwriting is the firm's handwriting, but a couple of partners and a couple of managers and, and the office administrator do sign that. So let's keep moving on. Now, are you saying do not recommend sending Christmas cards? All we're saying is just try different things. Um, 
but but our experience has been within the Christmas time. There's a lot of Christmas cards going out, and we want our marketing material to stand out from the crowd. So another idea that uh, several firms do, and we've done it ourselves, is to send Thanksgiving cards because they do, in fact, uh, stand out from the crowd. I want to just come back and focus on our on our marketing plan. All we're looking for is a marketing plan uh, that's one page long. So just based on what we're going to do today, just come up with half a dozen things that you commit to do, put it down on a piece of paper, make sure everyone in the office knows what it's about. Direct mail to current clients. We've got to get out there to all of our current clients and say, get in here for some tax planning. Uh, encourage them to come in to talk, particularly a lot of those clients that we might only see once or twice a year. Let's try and increase another uh, contact point. Um, obviously with this fiscal cliff there is anxiety out there and this is your opportunity to get in front of that and we recommend offering tax planning for free or if you're going into that fixed price type of area include that in the bundle but we know one firm in uh, Georgia, uh, Atlanta, Georgia they wrote they offered tax planning on an ad hoc basis when a client called up and we said to them why don't you write out to all of your clients and see what happens and they attributed at least fifty thousand dollars in revenue to new revenue with current clients just by getting in front of them and talking to them about some of the issues that the year end does bring about so it's definitely worthwhile and, and a, a very simple letter that we can get out um, this week or next to our current clients add the short form tax organizer we said that with the post-it note and ask them to pass it along to anyone who may need help with their taxes that post-it note is really important otherwise you're just going to confuse uh, you're just going to confuse uh, the, the recipient. Uh, Richard asks, when you say letters, is sending emails instead of letters as effective? I think direct mail and the physical letter is more effective than an email just because it's so easy to delete and I know myself I can either delete or I can think, oh, I'll get to that and then all of a sudden another 30 emails have come in that are more um, that are more important to deal with. So I think direct mail, that physical envelope uh, coming um, really prompts people and, and one of our tax organizers that we try and send that out for example on a Thursday uh, so that it lands on a Saturday as people uh, are at home as people are maybe going through some of their office finances or whatever so we think the physical letter is much more successful than email but again just test it and see what works best for your firm so direct mail to business clients we can't just go out and talk about how great a CPA firm are or how great an accounting firm we are. What's your offer? Tax planning. What about an accounting review? Because we all know that that's one of the big sore points when we've got to get in and spend a lot of time cleaning up a client's QuickBooks. So we might uh, offer that as a way of uh, getting businesses to come in to talk to us. We might be looking at a new year, a new payroll processor. We want to get to what their pain and frustration is. And in that uh, tax season marketing bundle, you'll see a number of letters which can really help uh, get to the heart of what are the key frustrations. Always got to have a freebie. And Chris, what is the 57 ways to grow your business? Well, this is a new book I've just completed. Uh, I originally wrote a book which we'll come look at probably later or uh, that you can... Uh, ask us about called the new business kit but what a lot of uh, firms were asking for was what do we have that we can give to our existing businesses or to the kind of prospects we're trying to get which are people already in business so um, over the last couple of years we've written this book it's called 57 ways to grow your business bright ideas for serious entrepreneurs and the one that you're looking at on screen is the one for our firm because obviously got my name on the front and our practice details on the back. But uh, Damien, what if people would like to put this out under their own name? Yeah, this is part of the tax season marketing bundle and this is when we publish through Create Space, we're able to uh, publish very cost effectively a professional looking book. So uh, it's a licensing agreement we will then take over production for you, insert your name, insert your logo, the blurb on the back, and then set it up on createspace.com uh, so that you can order your prints. And then um, the only thing is you can't sell it on Amazon, but you can give it away to current clients, to referral sources, to prospective clients. We normally we have a pile of them sitting in our reception area, in everyone's office, in everyone's meeting room. 
this speaks volumes about you being uh, the, 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 the trusted advisor. This is an incredibly valuable tool and if you want to uh, get your name, get your photo, get your information on there and get that turned around, we can have that back in your office probably in about two weeks, maybe before Christmas, uh, certainly before the new year. This is a great giveaway, a great freebie. P.S. Call now for your free 57 Ways to Grow Your Business book and uh, then we find a lot of our members are actually going around and dropping that off. Um, at prospective clients, but uh, we get a lot of clients that say, hey, do you mind if I take a copy on the way through? So check out the, uh, the website and ask more information about this one. Mark asks, what about postcards instead of letters for new clients? I think it has to be a blend of both because we want to use as many different media as possible. Often postcards, if they're bright, flashy, oversized, People will look at them, but we can't get as much information there. So I think a combination of letters and postcards are important. What about a newsletter, Chris? Because this is really important, especially if we're only contacting so, or if we're only seeing some of our clients once, maybe twice a year. How do we leverage um, different media out there so that we can touch our clients more often and always be top of mind? We've had a lot of uh, university research that's been done in the last couple of years on how often people want to be touched. Uh, and what we found is that people want to be contacted by their accountant at least once a month, and we found that the optimum is every two weeks. Now, that's, if, you, if you were to do that yourselves and create all the content, uh, it would be a massive job. So there are a number of alternatives out there. Uh, one that we use is a company called Biz Actions. Yeah, that's B-I-Z-A-C-T-I-O-N-S, bizactions.com. And what they will provide you with is a, a, a newsletter that's got all of the articles already pre-written. They've got a whole staff of writers that do this. And what it also allows you to do is to go in and customize uh, any any of the articles, put your photograph on the front if you've got a short article you want to write or you want to do a, a client profile or an employee profile, uh, you can do that quite easily so that you differentiate yourself from the rest. And the best thing is during tax season, every two weeks that newsletter is going out. And so our objective now is to increase that uh, newsletter database, that email database, so that we drip on our clients more often. And we're, we're in the process now of setting everything up. So we call it our fire and forget campaign so that nobody actually has to physically do anything for that newsletter to go out. I guess the one thing we have to do is we've got to read it, don't we, Chris? Because we will get calls. Well, that, that's helpful. <laughs> um, let me just say that one of the things we like about Biz Actions is that it's a flat price regardless of the number of email addresses. So one of the things that we're doing in our firm is we just bought a list of 5,000 um, email business addresses owners. of business people in our county. And just think about that. 5,000 people getting a newsletter every two weeks. Got to believe that some something's going to happen. And you might already have a newsletter with your current website provider, but Biz Actions has a phenomenal thing. And uh, can you give that email again for Biz Actions? You've spelt it there correctly, Barsha. Uh, so it's B I Z Actions, A C T I O N S. And uh, give us a call if you have any questions. And I think we can actually get you some discounted pricing through our association. So give me a call and ask us about that. But what we want to be doing is every two weeks something goes out. What we found though is clients probably read one in ten newsletters. But we've got to think psychologically, well, we've got to think about from a marketing standpoint, we're dripping on people. The unsubscribe rate is incredibly low and it really allows us to track what people are, uh, are interested in. So um, get yourself a newsletter and, and get going with the fire and forget campaign. Chris, networking, traditional networking, what do you think? You're a big fan of it. Of course, because I've built four practices in my career, all of which I've sold and done very well with, and we're now in the process of building up a fifth practice. And one of the keys to it is networking. Uh, networking generates relationships, and relationships generate referrals. And so... So many CPAs uh, eat lunch at their desk 
and we just look at that as antisocial and inappropriate. So one of the jobs of our marketing person is uh, for her to help us get out to lunch more often, uh, either with clients, with referral sources, um, with prospects. But if you don't have someone schedule that for you in advance, then it, it tends not to happen. So I would set a goal uh, for partners, certainly of, of two to three uh, lunch meetings per week, uh, again with the marketing person uh, organizing that. Now one of the alternatives you've got, especially if you're trying to get uh, young people in your office to start developing their own portfolio, their, their own uh, group of prospects is BNI. Absolutely, and uh, Business Networking International, and, and you can see it's an international organization and they uh, have the English spelling of organization, but I hope everyone knows what a BNI group is. Now, they can be incredibly effective, and Dennis over in the East Bay, he is up at the crack of dawn every Monday and is front and center at that meeting because he can attribute at least $100,000 of work every year from that Business Networking International meeting. So there's no other CPA allowed in the group. And honestly, you might have to go to a couple of different groups to find the right fit. The other aspect of it is because this is a much larger transaction, it's got some financial issues associated with it, sometimes the referral takes a little bit longer than, say, a traditional florist or maybe the acupuncturist or someone that might be sitting in the room. But uh, another thing we found is it was really great for some of the young folks to get along to uh, because it really helped them refine their elevator pitch, their value proposition, and what they were able to offer and what they were able to, what they were looking for. But if you can't commit to that meeting every week, then it's not going to work for you. And in fact, they'll actually kick you out, won't they, Chris? They will indeed. But we have a number of our 2020 members who tell us that they get the majority of their new clients off of BNI. Absolutely. Now. I'm uh, on this cusp of Generation Y and, and the Chamber of Commerce and Business Networking International isn't really something that I get excited by, but I do see the value by, of Business Networking International and certainly Toastmasters uh, in, in helping me refine my value proposition and improve my speaking ability. But I do my networking uh, in my community involvement. I'm a big fan of Leukemia Lymphoma Society and I've really built a, a nice network of professionals through Leukemia Lymphoma Society. So encourage your folks who are active in the community to look at that as a way to build their network as well. Particularly some of the younger folks, there's attorneys, there's lawyers, there's uh, graphic designers, there's a, a huge cross-section of people that are involved in these community organizations that many of you are already involved in. So let's see if we can use some of those, uh, those things that we're doing already and that we like doing, use them as networking opportunities. So encourage your, folk, uh, encourage your team to, to build their network through those types of organizations. And that would obviously include the church, synagogue, mosque, uh, whatever, whatever they do that they enjoy doing, PTA, uh, coaching Little League beat, Baseball. These are all opportunities uh, to build networks. Uh, and Catherine comes in and says the Leeds Club is also an international networking organization actually based in California. And uh, she's been going uh, to that and has been a part of that and used it very effectively for 20 years. So that's, uh, that's good feedback, Catherine. Uh, Steve says, we've not gotten business accounts from BNI, only a few 1040s. It paid for itself, but not the ROI we were expected. Um, the most successful members in our groups were retailers uh, and small priced items. Any thoughts? Steve, yes, I, I, I think that's uh, a definite, we hear that. And that's why I would suggest that depending on where you are, Steve, there should be some other BNI organizations around. And that's why I said you might have to move around a couple of organizations to find the right fit. So we have had that feedback, but we have also had the other feedback where, and a guy in New Jersey springs to mind, um, Dan, and he, he has at least $60,000 of work, but he had to go to three different BNIs to find that group. So maybe see if there's other opportunities out there, out there, Steve. And if you don't uh, find that the group you're in 
makes uh, makes sense or a good ROI, you could always start your own group. And this has been very exciting for a number of our members. Actually, we've got one guy down in uh, Dallas, Texas, and he didn't like the BNI groups that he went to. And a couple of other uh, professionals were saying the same thing. So they formed their own. And guess where they meet? They meet at the local hospital. Uh, they pay for a training room at the local hospital, and they meet there once a month. And essentially what that has turned into, it's become office hours. So a doctor can pop by during office hours, so to speak, and talk to either an accountant, a financial planner, an estate planner, an insurance agent, and this has been very successful for them. So if it's not working for you, then, then think creatively outside the box, and there might be a way in which you can do that. So Damien, you're talking about being a millennial here. How important is a website? Um, it is incredibly important, and it is, it's so much more important than just having a presence on the web, because this really is, for many instances, your first impression. Now, from a sales perspective, and probably from a, a more complicated return or more complicated client, they may not necessarily go straight to Google and search. But at the same time, Chris, we, we picked up a, an interesting client, didn't we? Because they were so frustrated with their current, client, uh, current accountant. They just went to Google and, and typed in uh, accountant, international tax, uh, Marin County. And lo and behold, we came up. Our first impression on the website was phenomenal. And they picked up the phone and gave us a call. So it does happen. But more often than not, it's a referral, a recommendation. Someone has said, hey, you should check out Fredrickson Crawford. So we'll, then they will go to Google and check that out. Now, it's really important to establish credibility here. Now, 60% of accounting websites all look the same because it's the free or the low-cost templated one that you got with your tax software. So we've got to try and avoid that and look at the colors, look at the image. A lot of those stock images are from the 1980s and 1990s. And if on your website you're saying we're cutting edge, forward thinking, proactive, and your photos are of the partners are from the 1980s or 1990s, um, the, the, your, what you're saying and what you're actually projecting are two different things. So we've got to make sure that, uh, that the two match up. I was looking at websites yesterday and doing some research, and I just couldn't believe how similar they all are. It's all about lists of services, you know, audits, compilations, reviews, weddings, bar mitzvahs, just these long lists, uh, and, and it's just boring. People just are not going to focus on that. And what we want to make sure is our website provides some personality. So if you are looking at your website and you need a bit of a makeover, uh, and we can certainly talk about your website as a part of that tax season marketing bundle, uh, you might want to talk to GetNetSet. So that's G-E-T-S-E-T, -E -E Get net set g e t n e t s e t dot com talk to chris there he's a cpa uh, and he's actually a creative cpa so that sometimes there's not so many of those folks out there but um, he'll sit down with you spend some time with you work out what type of image you want to project and create a um, a, a, a great website and then also they're very open to feedback and updating, and so they put their standard content on, and then we go in and we make that content our own. So uh, get net set. CPA Site Solutions is also, they've got some really good templates and some really good websites, seeing some more of those. Um, so get out there and have a look at different websites. Let's so, have another so what poll. what can I do? Oh, oh, let's have another poll question, right, Chris, let's do that. if that's okay. So what I want to ask is the marketing material a true reflection of who you are. And by marketing material, I mean your brochures, your business cards, your letterhead, your website. Uh, are you saying that you're professional, forward-thinking, proactive, boutique service, but then your paper stock is 20-pound paper? Uh, are you saying that you're not like the other accountants, but your website looks pretty similar to most other accountants? I'd just like to get some feedback in terms of ranking yourself, um, just to make sure your marketing material is a true reflection of who you are. Okay, so um, there's some different comments coming in about BNI and and Le Tip. Some it, it it's not for some people. I'll be honest. Some people it is too big of a time commitment. If you don't have the time commitment, I would suggest moving on. But I'll certainly share these comments with the group. Uh, so uh, Hutch, the killer website CPA uh, Site Solutions or Get Net Set, and Chris at Get Net Set. Uh, he'll give you a special deal if you mention 2020, I believe. Uh, so let's um, just keep that open for a few more seconds. It's interesting. 75% of people are looking for a local professional. They'll look online first. And we've got to be thinking about what are our clients actually looking at. So let's close that poll. And we've got about 90% voted.
don't worry if you missed a poll because uh, and then let's share those and a fifth of the uh, the attendees have said uh, is your material a true reflection of who you are yes and fantastic and, and I'd probably say you've spent some time and uh, some and strategic thinking about what image you do want to project so fantastic 63% yes, but could do with some work, and that's probably what we see most of. So let's have a look at our marketing materials and see what are we using that gets the best bang for our buck. And for example, that 57 Ways to Grow Your Business is a phenomenal tool that really puts you professional, published, and sets you apart from a, a large number of CPAs. And then only 20% have said, no, we're embarrassed to leave anything behind. So give us a call and let us know how we might be able to help uh, the good thing, and we learned from uh, Jim Collins, is it, it doesn't take us to much to move from good to great. So some small tweaks should be able to bring some uh, good results around. Damien, if people uh, would like you to look at their image, is that something that you can do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and particularly as a part of that marketing tax, uh, that tax season marketing bundle, we'll uh, make sure we get on the phone. Go to the website. We can go have a look at your LinkedIn profile. We can look at some of your materials to get some, uh, see how we can make some fine tuning, some tweaks to get that. So now, how do I add personality to my website? How do I make it look really different? Well, um, I love this website, and I'll just make sure that it's coming through on your screen. Uh, here's a three-point checklist. Is it up to date? Uh, now, let, we've got to make sure the partner pictures are up to date as well. We we see some partners on their from the their glory days of the 1990s with some big hair and big shoulder pads but um, that's not who they are now so let's make sure it's up to date um, I hate going onto a website and seeing last updated in 2008 or last news or latest news and it's 2010 that really doesn't say that we are cutting edge and proactive and forward thinking uh, so let's make sure our website is up to date Chris how many websites do you go to or what's your number one frustration with your website well, I had it yesterday uh, looking at some big firms' website. I could not find the phone number, and I could not find the address. The only way I could get to that was finally go into the, the, the profiles of the partners. Even on the, the page where it says contact us, the only way you can contact them is by putting in all your uh, data and sending them an email. Uh, for heaven's sakes, make sure that your phone number's right up front on the landing page and also give us your address because people often want to send you something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the third thing, the third item on the checklist is a clear value proposition. I would like everyone to take this website address down, thewowcompany.com. They're an accountancy firm out of the United Kingdom and this is what you see when you go to their front page. Make more profit, pay less tax and have more fun. Isn't that different from every other CPA site that we see? But very clearly is what their value proposition is. We're going to help you make more profit, we're going to help you pay less tax, and we're going to help you have more fun. More often than not, it's our name in lights when they first come to a website. Right here is a clear value proposition, and so it's thewowcompany.com. And if you go to, uh, we don't have it on, on the site here, but if you actually go to that Team Wow section, You'll see Team Wow, and I think that's really important. You'll see Team Wow, uh, and they're actually their baby photos. And then when you scroll over it, it comes to what their picture is now. So thewowcompany.com is a great website. What's that um, company in Eugene, Oregon that also has a great website, Chris? Uh, I think you're thinking about Jones and Roth. Jones, ampersand, Roth, R-O-T-H. Um, they have an excellent site, and what they've done is the photographs of the partners and the team members are all outside of the office doing the things that they really love, whether that's horse riding, whether it's teaching uh, Little League, whether it's playing golf. Uh, so you really get the feeling of the personality of the people. Uh, rather than just the typical stuffy pictures. Yeah, exactly, because what we know is people want to do business with folks that share the same passion as them, and that's really important. So anything you can do to show personality, um, if you coach the Little League, uh, if you uh, are active in Habitat for Humanity, active in your local church, get pictures of those rather than you in your suit and tie and, um, and the 1980s prom background. We just see those being much more effective, and when people come to that website, they smile and want to pick up the phone. So uh, thewowcompany.com and jonesandroth.com.
www.thinkdigital.com. So some final considerations. Where are you on the search engines? And we're going to launch now into how we can improve our web presence because the web is an amazing platform that I, I think is underutilized by accounting firms. So after today's webinar, let's, uh, let's do a Google test. And I know Albert's come back and said he shows up number one every time. But what we want to do is let's Google tax help in your city or town, CPA in your town and city, accountant in your town and city. Where are you actually showing up? Because unless someone's specifically looking for Fredericks and Crawford, which is our CPA firm, the, the end user is going to plug their, their question into, into Google. And I know, for example, in Excel, I will just type into Google, what is the formula for such and such in Excel? We're seeing that those are the questions being asked into Google. It's not CPA Corda Madeira, it's tax help. I need help with my taxes in Corda Madeira. So think about that. So where are you on the search engines? So let's just Google those three things and see where we are. And if we're not in the top three or four, then I would hazard a guess that we're missing out. And when people are not going to scroll down, you know your own behavior. Unless you're looking for something very specific, uh, you're not going to really go past those three or four um, ads. So Google Analytics. Um, what, I, and, uh, what I would suggest is uh, everybody signs up for Google Analytics. And that is free, which is fantastic. So go to Google and Google Google Analytics. And um, what we want to do is we want to get feedback in terms of our website's performance. How are people finding us? How many visitors are we having? What is our, what is our web presence? Where are people? What is the source traffic? What are the keywords that people are using? And Google Analytics has a ton of information. And again, if you want to spend some time on, there's probably a thousand metrics in there, but we can really narrow it down to maybe five metrics that we look at maybe on a weekly basis, maybe on a, uh, a bi-weekly basis. And what do we then do with that information? Well, we've got to monitor it, and particularly the keywords now, traffic sources, then we can start to, um, then once we have some information, then we can start a web strategy. We look at other platforms such as YouTube, such as Yelp, such as Twitter, that may drive more traffic to our website, Chamber of Commerce. The more times we can get our website on other people's websites, the better it's going to improve our performance. So here's a couple of things. And I, first of all, a case study. Uh, this is one of our firms in, cent in the Central Valley of California. After three months, their website traffic was up 50%. I don't know exactly what that means from, from a numbers standpoint, number of visits, but a 50% improvement is dramatic. Previously, keyword search was the named partners, uh, which is understandable. People are looking for Chris Fredrickson because that was the referral. But now, agriculture and CPA, agriculture and accountant, that is how, what people are putting into Google, and their firm is coming up number one. Interestingly, their blog, here's the power of a blog. It's the second most visited page on their website. So more often than not, they go to the home page and then straight over to the blog. And here is how people have found their blog. They type into Google in the Central Valley, uh, California car donation tax benefits. That blog article comes up number one and two in the search engine. Uh, QuickBooks reconciliation summary. Somebody type that into Google. And QuickBooks reconciliation, that's how people are finding their blog. And I love this one, how do I avoid and delete transactions in QuickBooks? They wrote a blog specifically on that, and that gets a huge amount of traffic. So that's been, uh, that's been very interesting. Uh, the other aspect of it was uh, nearly 20% of their traffic sources are now coming from social media. And they know that probably only 10% of their actual client base is engaged in social media. They've gone out and researched that and surveyed their clients. But 18%, 20% of people coming to their, tra coming to their website uh, is from social media. And here's what the Chamber of Commerce is doing. Um, because they're tweeting interesting information, tax deadlines, tax updates, information that is useful to, the, to their community, the Chamber of Commerce is tweeting that. And that goes out to their 1,700 followers. So you can see how the opportunity grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. I mean, in fairness, though, that firm that you're referring to, the only reason this has happened is because they did in fact go out and hire a young person 
who's grabbed a hold of this. Yeah, absolutely. And Dawn asks a good question. I'm in a large market, Chicago. How could I possibly be in the top three or four on a Google search? Dawn, you won't be if you're just uh, Dawn surname CPA. But if you've got some blog articles or some keywords within your website that talk about QuickBooks help or talk about help for specific industries or specific individuals, uh, you're not going to come up one, two, three uh, from an uh, from CPA or accountant standpoint, but you could certainly have an opportunity to come up one, two, three, four with QuickBooks help or, or, or some of these other QuickBooks related or some of the other questions that come into to Google. And I'll show you how you can find some of those uh, some of those keywords. Search engine optimization, Google Analytics is free. We've got to find out how people are finding you. And this is what Google Analytics is really helpful for. We've got to think like your clients, not like accountants. What are the most frequently asked questions your clients ask you? Uh, how do I fill in this form? What, when do I need to lodge this form by? That's what people are using Google for, to find those answers. They're not searching for accountant called a Madeira. They're searching for how do I fill in W4? Uh, and then what we've got to do is once we know how pe what people are searching by, we've got to utilize multiple platforms uh, to, to get our message out. So let's ask the question now, another poll question. Uh, are you using social media to engage clients and prospective clients? And we'll look at some of these questions. Uh, Doug, the PowerPoints, uh, I believe you can download from, uh, from Scott's website. They should have been in that email. And I'll have him just double check again. Um, are these slides on your site? If you want to send me, if, if you can't find them by a Scott site, please shoot me an email and I'll get them to you. Now, what we want to use with our social media is we want to use that to demonstrate our personality and get across a number of platforms. And Chris, any success stories you can think of of um, people utilizing social media? Yeah, I think it's really taken off. Um... You know, what we what we hear from people is that they they get pretty good chunky clients. Like I, we've got one in Phoenix uh, that just brought in a thirty thousand dollar client because the the the, the client in in question starts um, was saying I get more information from you, I get more contact from you than I ever do from my existing CPA. So yeah, I think this is fascinating and very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And the best thing about it is we can do it from the comfort of our office. We don't have to go to those uh, Chamber of Commerce meetings, which I don't like. Chris loves. I do not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let's have a look at the poll and let's share that poll. 14% uh, of saying yes, we're very active. 20% say yes, we, uh, but we don't quite know how to do it yet. Nearly 50% have say are saying no, but I would like to. And then 20% uh, no and have no plans to. And, and uh, I can certainly see some of those folks, uh, they would like to stick their head in the sand and, and hope that uh, it will never, it'll just go away. But what we know is the way people make their buying decisions has changed dramatically. And social media really allows us to take advantage of that. Okay, let's have a look at Google Analytics. And here's what's really important. So this is for our, uh, our blog, Million Dollar CPA, which we're shifting over to 2020 Group. But we come to the front page and here's what we see. So, and what we can do is we can overlay visits versus percentage of new visits up top here. Oh, I'm not sharing that. I do apologize. We'll wait for that to come through. Sorry about that. I, uh, I got ahead of myself. Um, yep, here we go. So you should be seeing that now. But what we're seeing that is in this last month, 185 people have visited our website. 155 of those have been unique visitors, so that's not people coming back regularly. Uh, on average, they visit 1.7 pa uh, pages of our website, and on average, they're staying there for a minute and 42 seconds. Uh, percentage of new visits, so that's where we haven't received their IP address before, 70% uh, are new visits, so that's good. This bounce rate is interesting. This means that when they come to our website, maybe by Google, they plug something into Google, they click on our website, and they immediately realize that it's not what they were looking for. So they'll either press home or back. And what that's saying is 70% of our audience are bouncing. So they just, they see it, not what they were looking for, and disappear straight away. So when we look at this, we'll want to come back next month and see how we've improved on that. How have we changed some of our keywords? How have we changed some of our descriptions so that our bounce rate is lower, maybe our visits is higher, 
and maybe the average duration is longer. So that might be what we want to might be one of the things that we do want to have a look at. Next, we see the traffic sources. How are actually people getting to us? Uh, no surprises. Google is is number one, and then probably no surprises. Uh, one of our other websites is number two. But this is really interesting. Uh, when we look at organic versus referral results. And down here we've got LinkedIn. So we can see, for example, that other firm that said 20% of new um, traffic is coming from social media. They must have had some LinkedIn, some Twitter, some of their blog up here. And that's what's sending them to the website, which is really important. You can then go in and you can then go in and have a look at the keywords. So what was something that somebody plugged into Google that then caused them to click on your website. And it was interesting, uh, this firm in the Central Valley, they actually said that uh, one of the key ways in which people were finding them was, um, and I'll just use the, the county, Fresno County property tax. And because there was a, uh, a blog article on, um, a blog article on Fresno County property tax, they came up and, and now all of a sudden that key word is really going up and it's, I think that might even challenge uh, agricultural and accounting for them in terms of, uh, of what's going on. Uh, let's have a look at um, one other thing. Talk with your website provider and we've got to go beyond CPA and town. We've got to think about our clients and, and a great way to do that is think about the most frequently asked questions you get. Uh, we're going to talk about Google AdWords um, a little bit, and that's that pay-per-click campaign. And so that'll tell us what questions are they asking Google. And then the other area we want to do that is we want to make sure we're present on other databases and other search engines. Um, and, and one of those is uh, making sure that we're on, obviously Bing, Google, and Yahoo, they're the traditional search engines. But we've got to think as well, YouTube, for example, is a, a huge... Uh, search engine. We'll talk so about that. Second shortly. biggest, isn't it? Second largest. That's right. But, uh, most CPAs uh, look at LinkedIn as being the sort of professional place to go. What do you think about LinkedIn? LinkedIn is is a phenomenal resource used correctly, but we've got to go beyond the profile. I get a lot of calls from folks that say, Damien, I created my profile and nobody's called or nobody's emailed me. That's the same, same as you going to the Chamber of Commerce and just hanging out by the prawn cocktail. You can't just sit idly by and wait for it. We've got to demonstrate expertise and I'll show you a very easy way in which we can really get engaged in LinkedIn uh, very, very efficiently and very time efficiently. Um, interesting point. Uh, in CPA conferences, social media is discussed and we're advised to stay out of it for liability issues. Even the malpractice insurance advised to opt out of it. Please advise. Um, I haven't heard that and we disclaim, disclaim, disclaim. That's what we think is most important, but social media is incredibly valuable and it's incredibly important marketing aspect for us. But uh, everything that you see on, our, on all of our social media disclaims, disclaims, disclaims. This is general advice. Please contact us. So that I think is really important. But let's go have a look at LinkedIn. Once you've set up the profile, a uh, quick question, what is SEO? That's search engine optimization. That's what we've got to get when, uh, that's what we're looking at when we've got a web presence. How do we enhance, how do we optimize our presence on the search engines? And what it means is that when someone Googles either you or uh, whatever whatever your keywords are, that you come up in the first three or four names because typically people won't go beyond the first page or maybe the second page. Uh, so if you're number 128 on the search engine, uh, no one's ever going to find you. No one's going to find you. So we've got to look at how we can specialize and that might, and how we enhance our presence on other people's websites. Al um, adds a, Albert adds a, a good, or Big Al as I believe he's known about town. Um, he says that one of the best referring sites for him was a success story or a case study on the Chamber of Commerce website. So you've got to think about where can I get my name on other websites. LinkedIn is one of them. Now, here's how we can make the most out of our LinkedIn. We've got to join groups. And groups are essentially um, web-based uh, user groups, if you will, of people sharing similar issues. So this one, for example, I just went to the group section there, plugged in construction, because I know a lot of our member firms have niches in construction, 
and found the Construction Professionals Forum. And what it tells us is there are 44,000 members. Interestingly, we've got a tax partner there. We've got um, National Association of Construction Auditors, uh, Dallas CPA, Professional Corporation. So accounting firms are a part of this. And what it means is whenever there's an opportunity for us to demonstrate value, we've got to make the most of it. And I'll show you how we can do that. On the right-hand side, we see similar groups. So, for example, we're in the Bay Area, so Sacramento Construction Professionals came up, and that might be something that we want to join. But let's look at some of our industry niches, some of our specialities. Uh, maybe some of our Marin County has a very active uh, LinkedIn forum just for business owners within uh, Marin County. I think there's about 25,000 members of that LinkedIn group and very active. Do you know anybody that um, can help with this? What's the issue on marine property tax, et cetera, et cetera? So there's very active groups. Look at the industry and then maybe look at your local area to see what's around. Then you've got to sign up for the, uh, the daily digest or the weekly digest. The last thing I want to be doing is going and trawling through LinkedIn groups to find uh, what's going on. But every day or every week, I get an email from, uh, from LinkedIn that says, here are the active discussions. Now it's even easier to follow thought leaders on LinkedIn. So any active discussion across any of the groups comes through in these emails. And all I can do is scroll down very quickly just to see if I can demonstrate some value, demonstrate some expertise. And you can see here, I have a client who is a UK resident but needs assistance with US taxes and US tax returns. Can anyone recommend a firm to me to obtain a fee quote? I know immediately that I can jump in there and provide some expertise, provide some value, or provide a referral. Secondly, we are looking to work with a business partner who specializes in international tax. Is there anybody out there? And again, all of a sudden, I can jump in there and contribute to that discussion. Obviously, maybe uh, overnight markets, the Dow sheds 243 points. I'm not that interested in that, so I don't need to click on it. But it's really helping us be efficient that if we said I've got 30 minutes to dedicate to social media a week, the weekly digest is incredibly important because this is, a, this is probably the exception in that we've got two lines there that we can show. But if, if there's just one discussion that I can participate in each week, then that's going to be incredibly valuable. Action steps, update the profile, connect with more people, connect with clients, referral sources, prospective clients, industry leaders, join a group, and then just sign up for that daily and weekly digest so you're not getting emails every single day. Uh, and then we want to make sure you answer a question and then also ask for a recommendation. So if you did a good job for your client and your client is okay, uh, and your client is okay with providing a recommendation, then ask them to do that. Some folks get a little bit um, worried about confidentiality of clients, but ask the client. And we've found that probably eight times out of 10, the client says, you know what, I'd be delighted to. I would be absolutely delighted to uh, provide a recommendation. So that's what I would suggest folks do is those clients that are active on LinkedIn, maybe ask them for a recommendation. Any uh, other referral sources or professionals that you've worked with that you've had a positive experience, write a recommendation for them. Uh, and then because of this reciprocity type rule, uh, more often than not, they will also write a recommendation for you. But when we see, we say how great we are, and then we get other people recommending us, that's incredibly valuable. So that's the action steps for, and we don't have a poll because we've, we've uh, moved things around slightly, but we've got to go beyond the profile. Let's get specific. Let's not be generalist. If you've got some niches in um, owner-operated businesses between one and three million, make sure that is mentioned or, or demonstrated somewhere on your profile. Don't just be a, a full-service accounting firm. Get really specific because also we're seeing a lot of firms where they're saying, um, I found you on LinkedIn when I searched real estate and accounting or construction and accounting, you came up. So let's get specific as we can. Twitter. A lot of people dislike Twitter. Chris, what do you think of Twitter? <laughs> I think it's, it's picking up. I mean, we, we just, we're seeing more and more uh, accounting firms using Twitter and getting good results with it. Yeah, absolutely. And because a lot of people, there's so much information out there in the world and what Twitter's allowing us to do, and it's, it's an interesting thing, it's, I guess, um, double-edged sword, that we can um, 
what am I trying to say? That we close ourselves off to people that we're not interested in hearing from. So with Twitter, we follow the people we want to follow. We follow the people we're interested in. So they might be accounting thought leaders. They might be our, our sports teams. They might be our favorite comedians. They might be our favorite politicians, if anybody does have any. But what it does, it allows us to communicate and find out what is on their mind. So the goal is to get followers. Now, so the first step uh, would be obviously to go in and put all of our clients in there. Yeah, well, let's look for our clients who are using uh, Twitter as a business development. Maybe not add the individuals initially, but if their business has a Twitter profile, then definitely add those. Certainly your referral sources, without a doubt your prospective clients, and we see a lot of firms now adding their competition just to see what their competition is saying. Um, in terms of a starting point, let's just start by retweeting what others are saying and maybe sharing an article. And it's interesting, we, have a, we go into firms and they say we don't know what to tweet. And I say, well, do you go to IncMagazine.com or Harvard Business Review or even the Sacramento Bee, for example, the local newspaper? And they say, yeah, do you ever find something interesting that you think your clients might find interesting? Oh, yeah, all the time. You just have to hit that share button. And what we found is the actual Twitter feed increased dramatically when we just start sharing articles. And so the first steps were when somebody read an interesting article, they then took that to whoever was in charge of marketing and said, I think people would be interested in this. And then uh, they make that decision. So a great way just to get started is, is retweet what some other industry or thought leaders are saying and then also share those articles. Um, once you're ready with sharing and retweeting, let's start to tweet some IRS changes, some deadlines, maybe some tax planning ideas. And again, on our Twitter feed, on the left-hand side, disclaim, disclaim, disclaim. I would recommend we avoid controversy. Let's avoid politics and religion, and let's just really focus on business building, wealth building uh, initiatives that, um, that build the profile of the firm in the wider community. And again, that firm in Phoenix picking up clients just because they're on Twitter and they're regular on Twitter and they're tweeting about five times a day. And with Hootsuite.com, you can tee up all of your week's tweets just to go out on a specific schedule. So again, another tool that allows us to be much more efficient. And with Hootsuite, it will send it out on all the platforms. Absolutely, yeah. That's the best thing about it. And uh, if, if, you're, uh, if you're tweeting as the firm in Phoenix is doing, they're picking up the feeds from irs.gov, they're picking it up from the local or the, the state tax agency. They all have daily feeds and they're just going in and massaging that and getting it out. Yeah, uh, very efficient. But again, we need that marketing person to do that. So that might be that intern a couple of afternoons a week, maybe a stay-at-home mum that's coming back into the workforce great positions. But here we go. Um, here's Rick Telberg of CPA Treadline. So here's how our 2020 Group USA, we've got a measly 177 followers um, and we're following 350 people. Rick, on the other hand, he has 11,000 followers. Rick and 2020 Group, we're in a similar business. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and have a look at who his followers are. And the general rule is to get more followers, I need to follow more people. And it's probably about three to, um, three to one or two to one. For every two people that you follow, one will follow back. And we've got a great firm up in uh, Santa Rosa getting into the wine industry. And that's been one of their key strategies is looking at who their clients are um, and then who's following them. And they've picked up a number of clients because they've followed them, they've sent them messages, they've put information out there that's interesting. And again, going back to Chris's comment, I'm getting more information from you than my own CPA. So find somebody that uh, it, it deals with the same type of people that you deal with. Look at who their follow. Look at who their followers are, and then get out and follow them. That's probably uh, the best. The best bet. Um, uh, Hossein asks, "Do I? I don't have a Twitter account. Should I start one? Why not? Sign up, and then just limit yourself. Find some people to follow, and then just limit yourself to maybe five or ten minutes a day." Uh, because it can become quite uh, consuming. So at the end of that five minutes, then we've got to, uh, we've got to switch off and get back to, to doing proper work. Yeah, it can be addictive, can't it? It can be, absolutely. But I would suggest start, sit on the sidelines, follow some people, uh, and away we go. So one of the major places we also get uh, a new work is from Yelp. And show us how uh, Yelp works. Yelp is a great resource, yelp.com, and that's, uh, it's a database uh, that the 
community goes in and rates their experience. More prominent in the urban areas, but also uh, because it is such a large search engine, probably maybe four or five in terms of the number of visitors visiting Yelp, um, even if you are in a rural location and you've got a Yelp profile and you've got some reviews, I think it would have some dramatic impacts on your search engine optimization. So we've got to think about what happens. The um, uh, a raving fan says you've got to check out Fredericks and Crawford CPAs. The, uh, the prospect goes to Google. They Google Fredericks and Crawford CPAs and here is what happens. Uh, Mallory asked just very quickly, uh, upgraded LinkedIn account or just the basic? I think the free account is more than enough. If you're really actively recruiting, sometimes that's probably the best benefit for some of those paid uh, upgrades. But here's what happens. Somebody Googles Fredericks and Crawford CPAs and they come there and guess what they see? They see our website first, which no surprises there. And if you go to our website, we'll talk about how great we are. We'll talk about how we help individuals, businesses, uh, how we help them with comprehensive wealth management and business planning. But who believes what we have to say? Whereas the next result down is Fredericks and Crawford CPAs on Yelp.com. And what that is, is we've got a five-star rating there. So three people have gone on and rated their experience with us five stars. So what that means now is whoever is uh, searching for us can then click on Fredericks and, or click on Yelp and they can see what the experience has been. Now, you've got the Yelp ad there, which is our competition, but nobody really clicks on those. They come down here to Sean W and they read about his experience. We just moved to Marin and we're looking for a new accountant after my old accountant made a $30,000 mistake on last year's taxes. What Sean is doing is he's sharing his experience and that's what people believe. Uh, I think that's really important because people don't won't necessarily believe us, but they will definitely believe Sean's experience, and that's what we're wanting to do. So Yelp really started out as a as a as a restaurant, yeah, absolutely, uh, entertainment yep. type of uh, review, but it's now really moving into the professional arena. It is, and um, uh, we're seeing some. Firm, we get probably four or five calls a week just from Yelp. And um, um, who is it? John over in the East Bay, he's looking at about 10 calls a day from, from Yelp. He's got too much work. He doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah, the biggest one I had is a $30,000 um, engagement. In fact, it was too big for us to handle it outside of our area, so I was able to refer it to another 2020 member. Um, but that was where someone just was so frustrated with their account and yeah. just went to Yelp. And once they saw we were five stars, they called us. Absolutely. Now, double-edged sword. Just because people can pr um, uh, add a favorable comment, they can also add a negative comment. And you can see here where two di two very opposing uh, reviews, one, four, uh, one one star and one five star. So again, double-edged sword, but we've got to sign up for different things like uh, socialmention.com and reputation.com that allows us to monitor that. When one of those uh, negative comments does come in, there's a couple of things we can either do. If it's just a complete fabrication, then we have to report that to Yelp um, and ask them to take that down. They have a series of steps that they go through. However, we actually see some firms, and we look at TripAdvisor, when a customer is disappointed, some firms just fess up and say, you know what, we screwed up. And they might say our server fell, fell over in that period of time. Uh, there was law changes that we weren't. Uh, completely on top of. Some people do just fess up. So different strategies for different uh, situations. So how does social mention work? So we go to socialmention.com, we sign up, and then we enter the keywords. And so the keywords for ourselves might be Fredericks and Crawford CPAs, Chris Fredrickson, Damien Greathead, anything that uh, refers to our firm. We put our clients in there, we put our competition in there, and whenever that is mentioned on a website or a social media site, um, we will get an alert about that. So that's a really cool free advi uh, free uh, resource, and I would suggest you just sign Fredericks and Crawford at gmail.com. You don't want all of these social, men particularly as that keyword list builds. You don't want all of these um, these email alerts coming in. So just set up a separate account and check that once or twice a week. A client gets mentioned, shoot them an email. Uh, a team member gets mentioned, shoot them an email to either say congratulations or you've got to shut some of your uh, Facebook privacy settings down. How do we get the Yelp um, ads or advertisements? Let's look at people who are active in Yelp 
that go to it, ask questions about that in the interview, and then ask, do you mind if uh, leaving us a testimonial? And we asked our three people to leave a testimonial, and they're more than happy to. And again, reciprocity, we then go and leave a uh, testimonial for our experience with their business. So that's probably, uh, probably the best way to do. YouTube, another great search engine. And all we're trying to do here is give you some different ideas for different platforms which we can get out on. Three billion views per day, second largest search engine. That just says opportunity. And let's have a look at an example. Let's have a look here at eHow Finance. And uh, interesting, her video, which is a, a minute 16, is tax help, IRS 1099 forms instructions. And we see that we've got 6,000 people have viewed this. Because YouTube is the second largest search engine, it doesn't matter if I'm sitting in California and I Google IRS 1099 forms instruction, some local things might come up, but this video will come up as well because of the sheer size of the, the search engine. So think about this over here as well. Tax help, how to fill out the W-4 form. 19,000 people have viewed that. And all we want to do is we want to leverage these platforms to put our name further up the, the search list and more importantly, get the competition off the list. Uh, I was uh, amazed by that when I did some research. 19,000 people have viewed how to fill out a W-4 forms. So HD cam, maybe some favorable lighting and go. As you can see here, it, we're not looking at a Spielberg-esque type presentation, but they're two, three minutes or less, and they're really just focusing on here is some help, um, uh, here is some help to fill out the 1099 form. So again, what are the frequently asked questions that you could be asking? Let's have a quick poll now. What do you think is uh, limiting your marketing efforts? And answer those there. So Bob, negative review, we've got to either report that to Yelp if it's a fabrication or we've got to look at uh, either fessing up if, if that's the other issue. And then also we've got to look at reputation.com and they might provide us with some tips on how we can push that review down. But as you saw with that other folks, if we do get a negative review, then we've got to get 10 more positive reviews to drown out that noise. Okay, so some, <laughs> um, what do you see as the biggest uh, thing holding you back? Time and don't know what to do. Um, and then uh, Patrick comes back with both. No surprises there. But uh, let's just uh, share that. And no surprises, 65% have said time, 35% have said don't know what to do. But hopefully we've given you a couple of ideas of what you might be able to do. You've got to get a marketing person in there because uh, your time is not, best use for this. Uh, so get a marketing person, whether that's, um, get a young person to come in and help you with this. That's the only thing that will change it. Okay, so YouTube, repurpose content, the tips, top 10 ideas, look at any, anything that you've done, uh, any seminars that you presented, these would make great topics for YouTube and any of those frequently asked questions. Sit down with the people in your office and say, what are the most asked questions? Let's finish with pay-per-click. Give it a try. Should I? Yeah, I, I say give it a try. Really bring the daily budget down, so it might just be $10 a day, so that might be $50 a week. But the best thing about that, nobody, you're not going to get a great result in terms of who clicks on your ad. This is really a research opportunity uh, because we can increase traffic to our website, in, um, and LinkedIn ads is, is, isn't a bad one to try actually, but Google AdWords is more about research how people are finding us. So for example, uh, here is one of the, the reports that come out of Google AdWords. This is how people are finding us. How do I prepare my taxes? Uh, tax help. And then it says how much that click is going to cost us. So there's a lot of competition out there for tax help at $6.25. So that's an expensive cost per click. So we might come down into how do I prepare my taxes? And we're looking at about $2 per bid. So the actual reporting here is really useful. But I would know now that since this is such a competitive keyword, I've got to make sure on my website, on my Yelp ads, on my YouTube channels, Twitter, tax help is prominent because that's going to push me up. Also, it allows me to be very targeted if I do want to talk about uh, what's going on. So here, for example, we're just focusing on the San Francisco Bay Area. So only those folks in my area will see that ad. And you can do that very effectively on LinkedIn as well. And we've had some success with LinkedIn, but you know it certainly pays for itself. 
but again, it's more about just getting a bigger web presence. Does pay-per-click give a good uh, return on the click? Um, it'll pay for itself, but probably some of the calls that you're getting uh, might be a lower end return. That's been our feedback that the clients haven't really fit with their demographic. But the more important information has been the keywords. How are people finding them? What are people searching for? So what we can do is we can set our budget, um, for example, $50 a day. That might just be $10 a day. And then we can see what the results are so we know exactly what people are clicking on. That's the best thing. So, And then we can increase traffic by adding 23 potential new keywords. So visit the sites, click on some links, see what some other ads are, uh, see what some of the, your competition is, and then decide what looks good and what doesn't. Uh, LinkedIn ads work well. Facebook ads, not so well. We don't see a lot of clicks with the Facebook ads. But again, you can set that budget and you can monitor it every week. And I think that's really good that as soon as I hit my budget of $25, I know I'm not going to spend anymore. So we can really uh, get that return on investment calculation. So action plan. And this is what we've got to suggest is we've got to sit down and say of everything we've talked about, let's just identify one or two or three initiatives or activities that we can get going. So for example, our Twitter action plan is we want to add 50 followers. AC is responsible for it and this is how they're going to do that. So spend some time to think about the initiatives that we're going through. Let's, uh, let's have one more poll. Where do you think you will get the biggest bang for your marketing dollars? And fill that in. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to end the show and I'm just going to go over to our website uh, just as we're letting that come in, and it looks like we're on time for a uh, 10.30 finish or 10.30 Pacific time finish. Um, any questions that have come through that we haven't been able to answer, uh, I've offered to Scott just to go back and answer those uh, and maybe share some of the comments that folks have come back with, and then Scott will share that with all the attendees, and that was really helpful last year or last week, I know. So let's close that poll. Uh, where do you think you'll get the biggest bang for your marketing dollars? 28% have said direct mail. 20% uh, have said enhancing your web presence. That's probably the most cost efficient one actually. Traditional networking, 16. 34% have said all of the above. And what I'd probably do is let's get, as, as Chris said, three or four things that we want to do. Put it in a plan. Who's responsible for it? And we've got to get that marketing person. Otherwise, March 15, the really important critical marketing activities just aren't going to happen. So I'm going to hide that poll and take you to our website, which uh, should be coming up fairly shortly. Uh, doesn't look like it is. Yep, there we go. So that's our website, 2020groupusa.com. Come over to this product section and you can buy the CPE Academy Special, which is the Tax Season Marketing Pro Bundle. So you're going to get all the direct mail letters and postcards. You're going to get the tax organizer. You're going to get the engagement letters, the pricing models, the scripts. And then the pro, you're going to get that fully customized 57 ways to grow your business. So then you would upload that to create space. So if you do have any questions about that, let us know. Uh, then if you're just looking at the Tax Season Marketing Light, that's all of the above except 57 ways to grow your business. So again, the direct mail program letters for individuals and businesses, uh, postcards, the organizer, engagement letters, the pricing models and scripts. And I think we'll also throw in 30 minutes of our time to talk about how you can implement this because that's really important. We want you to implement and we don't want to suffer from failure to implement. So that's something that, uh, go to our website, you can do that. We uh, distribute our resources through iShade and you can sign up for an iShade account by clicking that sign in button and uh, you'll be good to go there. Let's just ask one final poll question um, and, and, and it's, it's really very self-serving. Uh, would you like a complimentary 30 minute discussion with 2020 Group about implementing today's ideas into your tax marketing? And if, if, if everyone's okay with that, Scott will share that with me and uh, we will um, pass that on So, uh, and we'll get in touch. So catchphrase for subject line email that will get clients to open. Who knows? Test it. Split the list. See what happens. Try different things. Um, I, I'd probably say the one thing I know is all caps don't work. I don't want anyone shouting at me, but test, test, test. Chris? Yeah, I would put a, a number in there. 
So if it's tax, I'd put something like 13 biggest tax, uh, tax mistakes. Brian says, yes, but I'm thinking it might be too late for this tax season. Brian, I would disagree with you because we can implement two or three key things very cost effectively, I think, that will generate new business, uh, that will um, cross-sell services to current clients. So let's not uh, immediately say no to that. And Scott, I know we've come up on 10.32. I'm more than happy to, to stay here and answer questions. Um, but basically, I'll hand back over to you uh, because I know... Yeah, um, Damien, thank you. Thank you very much, Damien, and thank you, Chris. And uh, we're a couple minutes over, so I do want to at least make sure everyone knows what will happen next in terms of CPE. But I'd also uh, encourage you to stay on the line if you'd like to go through and answer any other questions that have come through, or you can always provide them in written format. And as last time, I'd be more than happy to uh, send them after the webinar to all of our attendees. Um, I, I do want to thank you again, though, for your time and your expertise and, and sharing all this content with all of us. Uh, I know I've learned something new today. This is not the first time I've, I've looked at the presentation and there's always some, some great information that, um, that I get out um, uh, of all of your content. So thank you very much for sharing the content. Thank you very much for offering this special deal to our membership. I, it's a great package. I certainly hope that uh, many of you uh, take the time to review um, the promotional uh, information that's going to be provided to you after the webinar. So in other words, we're going to send everyone an email. Uh, you'll find um, links to the site where you can get specifically to this package. And uh, you'll also find links to the evaluation as well as to the proctor letter. And we would greatly appreciate it if you would spend a couple of minutes filling out that proctor letter. Your feedback is very important to us. We take your comments extremely seriously. And so we certainly would appreciate you providing uh, not just a testimonial, but letting us know what we could do to, uh, to make constant improvement, which is what we always strive for. Um, I also want to mention that regarding the proctor letter, you could fill that form out and receive credit for as many people as, uh, as you need to. Uh, we have a lot of people that attend this class in a, shared, in a shared session, meaning that there's a single connection being made and, and many people sitting around and watching uh, the projector, for example. And so all you need to do is enter in your name and email address and we'll issue the CPE credits to you instantly. And um, uh, with that said, I'd like to uh, thank you once again. I, I hope everyone has a great weekend, if it's not too soon to say so. But with that said, I'm going to sign off, and, and Chris and Damien, I'll leave it uh, back to you guys for any closing comments and questions that you'd like to handle. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Just a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, some have said, um, does this stuff work for a home-based CPA or a sole practitioner? Absolutely, and it's the best way to grow. Uh, but again, let's just choose one or two things where we're going to get a big bang for our buck and just focus on doing those really well and they will have a great return on investment when they're done consistently and to the plan. So I, I think that's the answer there. Uh, a quick question about iShade. iShade is a web-based platform. Think about it as LinkedIn just for accountants. And so we use that to host our resources, to provide discussions, allow other members to find each other. And it's a really powerful thing that there are so many resources on there from some of the best, biggest and best, uh, brightest people in the accounting profession. So definitely create an account through our website and uh, join us on 2020 Group and there's a ton of resources there as well. So um, the other thing, uh, Facebook was one comment, how good is that? I think it's good for client nurturing and just keeping in touch with people, keeping in touch with your team. Don't see huge um, benefits, if you will, from a attracting new clients. Not to say that it doesn't work, but that's just been the feedback from members. Very good at nurturing current relationships, but not necessarily uh, attracting others. Twitter definitely attracts people. LinkedIn definitely attracts people. Your blog definitely attracts people. Um, so I would probably, it, again, depending on what that goal is at the start of the season. Chris, any final comments? Uh, you've taken down your own Facebook page. I have taken down my own Facebook page because I'm just not getting any value from it. It just seems to be cluttered with advertising, with marketing messages, and with pictures of my friend's meals or people that I went to school with, primary school with, what they had for dinner last night. It's not really adding any value. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. The platforms will change, but the actual idea of how we make our buying decisions will not in terms of we look to the community to help 
make our buying decisions. So folks, I will go through and answer any additional questions that have come through uh, via um, GoToMeeting and then uh, Scott will distribute those. So just keep an eye out for an email. It normally takes me a, a day or two, but I'll get those out as quickly as possible. And of course, anything, our contact information is on our website. You can see our phone number up the top there. Give us a call and we'll be delighted to, to do what we can to help your marketing efforts this tax season. Folks, I will sign off and say thank you very much. Have a wonderful day and uh, look forward to uh, and hope you have a wonderful tax season. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, tuning in today and we are always here to help.